Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on Chapter 9 of Interaction Design 4th Edition. Chapter 9 is entitled The Process of Interaction Design. And uh, in our course here, I think we're uh, turning a corner. And uh, I'm pretty happy about that, actually, because um, in the first eight chapters of the textbook, we've been really acquainting ourselves with the, oh, the language, the theory, the, the uh, kind of underpinnings of doing interaction uh, design in a scientific way. Okay, and um, it's uh, it's really been a, a departure from um, uh, typical practice um, of uh, the less informed, I would say, which which is really comes down to two things. One is what I would call tips and tricks. Okay, uh, and the other is I would just call kind of. Mm, anecdotal advice, right? So uh, we really have uh, g g gone to the trouble to look at a lot of the theory. Uh, we've looked at models. We've looked at all this kind of stuff to you know to really have the basis of being serious uh, practitioners. Now we need to pull it together, okay? So how do we use all this kind of stuff in a real interaction design practice? So in chapter nine, we revisit the process of interaction design with all these uh, new capabilities and sensibilities uh, already aboard. And we start to really talk about, well, you know, what's the project going to look like? All right. So here we are. Uh, so we're going to we're going to ask the questions. Well, what's involved in interaction design? We're going to be talking about the importance of involving users. Uh, not too surprising in our course, which is called user-centered interaction design. Uh, talk about the different potential degrees of user involvement in our process. Um, talk about what is a user-centered approach and how it might be different from other approaches that one could take. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the four basic activities that make up interaction design. And these are establishing requirements, designing alternatives, prototyping, and e evaluating. We're also going to talk about some of the practical issues. Uh, who are the users? Uh, what are the needs of the users and how can we learn about them? Uh, where do alternatives come from? If we're going to be designing alternatives, uh, where, where are we getting these? How are we going to choose among alternatives? And then um, we have a very interesting uh, discussion at the end of the, the chapter about how might we I integrate um, our interaction design activities within other life cycle models, like um, life cycle models for um, uh, software design and development. So, what's involved in interaction design? Well, we find it helpful to talk about this as a process. And again, we talked about the four activities within that process. Uh, it's a goal-directed problem-solving activity informed by intended use, target domain, materials, cost, and feasibility. And when we look at that list, um, it's not too surprising. Those are all things we've been exploring in previous uh, chapters. It's a creative activity. Um, on one hand, that makes it fun. On the other hand, it makes it uh, challenging. Uh, 
And there's going to be decision making uh, kind of integrated with the creativity, um, which we're going to have to use, which we're going to have to use in order to balance some of the trade-offs. Um, the generating alternatives activity is going to be key. So we're going to need to generate them and choose between them or choose among them, actually. Um, there are four approaches that we could take to interaction uh, design and, and that people do take. Uh, the user-centered approach, that's the one that we're going to be learning about in depth uh, here. There's also um, a good uh, discussion in the text of three other alternatives, activity-centered design systems design, ingenious design. And while all those things are interesting, they're not really our point of view for this course. So uh, I would invite you to explore them further on your own. So if we're going to do user-centered design, we're going to have to involve users. OK. And again, what are we designing? Well, we are designing interactive systems and uh, devices, OK? So these are people who will use the systems and or the devices. So um, there's a couple of things that we want to get done in uh, managing a relationship with this body of users. And one is expectation management, and the other is uh, cultivating a sense of ownership. Uh, so uh, whenever we go into the workplace, um, or into the marketplace too, I, um, most, of, most of the things that I've uh, designed and built and uh, managed have been for a fairly captive group of users who are uh, working for some kind of business or working for some kind of academic institution. Um, and so they are going to be using whatever we design in the workplace. But of course, if we're, if we're creating uh, consumer products, well, people might be using them um, in their daily life. They might be using them for... Um, well, to navigate in their cars or to uh, cook a meal in their kitchens and all those kinds of things. It, it, but whenever we go out and we start to talk to people who are going to have some kind of expectations of the results of a project, we need to manage those. Okay? It doesn't take much for us to uh, leave people disappointed. Okay? And, the, and so uh, the goal of expectation management um, is uh, simply to not leave people behind who we've interacted with who are disappointed at the end of the process. One thing we need to do is we need to set realistic expectations. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you learn about over time. Um, uh, another related course that I teach is uh, systems analysis. And um, in systems analysis, uh, 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 you know, my students are, are going to talk to people about their problems and opportunities and how we might create uh, solutions that either solve the problems or capitalize on the opportunities. Okay. Um, and in that course, we do have some emphasis on uh, uh, the appropriate user interface. Here, I think we're, we've just kind of turned it around. Uh, we're going to be the people on the team who are most responsible for the user interface, but at the same time, responsible for making sure that we kind of understand the problem that's being solved or the opportunity that's being uh, capitalized upon. In any case, uh, I try to tell my students that it's really important to manage expectations when you go out to talk to people. And um, it's probably best to uh, uh, 
uh, be, I think, fairly humble, right? So um, the reason that you're talking to them is that there's at least a possibility that there's going to be some kind of a, a new system or device or a product or way to do things. So there's some optimism in that. Um, you, as the practitioner, would like to think that that's going to be an improvement for whoever you're working with. Um, but you don't know, ideally, exactly what shape that's going to take. And you also don't know what the what the constraints on the project are going to be. So, uh, for instance, you don't want to be promising things to people. O okay. Um, you'll get a lot of questions about, are we going to be able to do this? Are we going to get one like this? I really would like this. Am I going to get that? And I think the best answer is uh, really this. Oh, you're interested in that. Now tell me about why. Okay, people who want something have got information that we need. So we're going to ask them why and we're going to play that out. And then they're going to say, well, am I going to get it? And I think the appropriate answer is, I'd like to believe that you're going to get what you want. Okay, my job is, is to collect all the information about what people see as the problems and the opportunities and how they work and how they like to work. And then a team of people are going to decide what's going to happen. I'd like to believe that the results will be something that you'll be happy with. But I, I can't really promise anything other than to represent your point of view as I experienced it when I worked with you. Okay? So people, I believe, should feel that they've been listened to. That people care about their worldview. Uh, but they shouldn't feel like they've been promised that they're going to get uh, some kind of product or service that is going to meet their current list of uh, demands because you can't really promise that. And in my experience, uh, simply promising that you'll listen to them and that you'll hear them um, is usually adequate. Okay? And uh, the fact is that you don't have any, uh, you know, you don't have any more power than that anyway. Um, so pretend to have, pretending to have more power than that, I think is only detrimental, okay? So if you take that kind of approach, you'll have, uh, as the board says here, no surprises and no disappointments, okay? You'll have set a general expectation that people want to do good in the world. Um, without promising exactly what form that's going to take. And if it turns out to please them, well, then they'll be all the happier. Um, if people are going to be using your product or, or service, um, it's going to be helpful to train them to do that in a timely way. You don't want their first interaction with your product or service to be negative because they haven't been appropriately uh, trained. Um, also, um, it, it's helpful to communicate with people along the way such that they know what's going on. Um, um, uh, you know, we, we, we go to talk to users fairly early on and we try to understand their needs and their preferences. And then maybe we go away and we work on the design for quite a while. So it's important to have some continuing communication with the community that we've worked with so that they have some idea about how things are uh, continuing. Uh, we don't want to hype them. We don't want them to come to believe things that are not going to turn out to be true. But we don't want them to feel that we've uh, disappeared on them. The other thing that we'd like to get uh, out of this interaction with uh, or our contact with this user group is we would like them to feel some sense of ownership um, in the project, uh, okay? Um, and ownership through their participation, uh, okay? So we want to make the users active stakeholders. And this is, uh, I think, this might be the first time within the text where we introduce this stakeholder word 
stakeholder is a very popular term in project management. Um, it's also popular in systems analysis, and and here we're seeing that it's becoming a popular word in interaction design as well. So um, in, in most parts of the world, stakeholders are people who have an interest in your your project, either in a positive sense or potentially even in a negative sense. So um, although we have a subsequent slide in which we we try to describe all those uh, people as users in some sense, it's probably better for us to say that um, there's a group of people who have some interest in our project, either because they're funding it or they're going to use it or they're going to manage the people who use it or perhaps they have a job that's going to change either positively or negatively because of uh, the results of our project okay and these all people can be thought of as stakeholders one of the key things to do is to have the user part of that uh, community be active in the project the more active they are, the more they feel that the project has listened to them in their point of view, the more likely they are to be satisfied with the outcome, even if the outcome isn't everything that they asked for. At least they know that everything that they asked for, well, they should know, that everything that they asked for was listened to. Perhaps it all didn't get into the final product or service, but we listened to them. The more likely to forgive and accept the problems and shortcomings if in fact they feel they were part of the process and this is just kind of human human nature i find that um i've spent a lot of my uh career as a consultant and so as a consultant i come onto the scene a lot of times after other people have been there before me and um uh, typically, there are some aspects of the situation that seem kind of bizarre. You know, how did we get ourselves into this uh, fix? And yet, when you, you know, when you take the time to talk to people who have uh, been there the whole time, uh, they'll explain how they got there. Um, and they're not as uh, shocked that they've gotten into the fix as you typically are from the outside because they've been active uh, participants the whole time along. Now, one of the good things that a person from the outside has to bring is a fresh uh, set of eyes and ears to this whole thing. But this is uh, kind of the, under, uh, the other side of this uh, buy-in phenomena is that you tend to be more satisfied with this situation that you were party to than one that you weren't party to. So how involved are we going to get the users? Well, uh, common wisdom is that we ought to make them very involved, okay? But the discussion in our text um, is I think a little more sophisticated than, you know, than that because as we get users involved, we, we have to make some uh, decision about how involved they're going to be and the, there's no perfect answer to that, okay? Uh, for instance, if we have a person or persons allocated to our team full time, we're going to get their constant input, but they're going to lose touch with other users. Okay, now as time goes on and we, there seems to be, a, it seems to be a preference over time for shorter product development and design cycles. Okay, and so if in fact that's true, perhaps having a person or persons full time in a short product uh, design and development uh, cycle is not a problem because they're not out of touch for long. Uh, but certainly in the days where uh, large uh, software projects would take two and three years, having a user away from the business for two and three years, a lot changes in the business in that time. 
So it's uh, potentially problematic. Uh, having people part-time um, can be a little bit of the best of both worlds, but um, it's probably the unusual person who's able to be good at that. Okay, I mean, there are some people who can keep uh, one foot in one world and one foot in the other world. And uh, as the bullet says here, it's a stressful experience for many. Uh, but for some people, I, I think that works uh, well. For other people, um, they either do a good job of one activity or the other, or perhaps a bad job of both. Um, another thing that we could do is that we could have uh, people allocated full time but short term across the life of the project. So we could get a series of people. Um, that might work well, but you'd worry about consistency, right? And uh, of course, with the long term, you have uh, consistency, but you lose touch with the users. So there's no real perfect choice. You have to, um, you have to, uh, you know, you're going to have to pick your poison on this. I think the one thing that does help is this idea that. As we move in a world where there's increasingly a preference to design things that are smaller, quicker, um, and get them to market faster, um, the possibility of taking somebody and putting on our team full time maybe gets more feasible. And that's probably good. Um, what other kinds of things are we going to do? Well, how do we keep people in touch with what we're doing? Well, we might use things like newsletters or blogs or those kinds of things. Uh, you know, we have the opportunity to reach a wide uh, selection of users that way. But of course, uh, uh, the classic newsletter is one way uh, that communications, perhaps something like uh, blogs where people could uh, comment and we could get some continuing input from a user community would be more promising. Um, uh, we need user involvement after the product is released. And this really, I think, really comes down to some kind of feeling about who owns the product. Okay, um, to the extent that the users who we're working with really feel that they own the product, well, of course, they're going to feel ownership after it's, after it's released, and they're going to want to continue to steer whatever uh, changes um, are going to continue to happen to the product. So let's talk about this user-centered approach a little bit more. Um, it's uh, based upon an early focus on users and tasks, directly studying the cognitive, behavioral, anthropomorphic, and attitudinal characteristics. All the stuff we've kind of learned to do in previous uh, chapters. Uh, empirical measurement. So users' reactions and performance to uh, scenarios, manuals, simulations, and prototypes are observed, recorded, and analyzed. Well, isn't that just the stuff that we went over in the last couple chapters? And then iterative it design. When problems are found in user testing, fix them and carry out more tests. So um, we keep getting back to these four basic activities uh, in user-centered interaction design. Establishing the requirements, designing alternatives, prototyping, and evaluating. We're going to talk about them some more. Uh, it's interesting to look at a model of this process that is uh, a kind of holistic and, and perhaps iterative, okay? 
when you look at the list on the previous slide, you can kind of think of this in the classic kind of a waterfall uh, project management uh, sense, right? We're going to establish the requirements. We're going to do, design alternatives. We're going to do, do prototyping. We're going to evaluate. Perhaps we'll choose one of the prototypes that represents one of the design alternatives, and then we'll continue on. You know, we'll build, right? Well, it's not always quite that neat. So, for instance, uh, as we're establishing the requirements, um, we may need to do some prototyping, right? So we're trying to figure out the requirements and we think of a couple of alternatives and then we prototype them. And then we go back and uh, uh, we go from those and we e evaluate them and then we go back to requirements. So this, it, this kind of way of looking at the process is much more continuous and iterative and uh, probably um, more realistic, right? The possibility that we could um, just as simply identify two competing alternatives and that one of them would all by itself be the right one and we could simply continue on in a a serial step-by-step -step kind of process. It's not very likely that that's going to give us optimal uh, results, okay? So this iterative kind of approach to these four activities uh, is very popular. It's also, as we'll see as we get to the end of the lecture, it's also very compatible with um, uh, current um, current ways of managing the software development process um, using uh, agile uh, software development. So uh, to the extent that we're designing a product that's implemented in software, um, this uh, way of looking at the world is uh, pretty compatible with uh, uh, a very popular current software development lifecycle model. Okay, so let's talk about some of the practical issues. Who are the users? What do we mean by needs? How are we going to generate these alternatives? How are we going to choose among the alternatives? Um, how are we going to iterate interaction design activities with other lifecycle models? And I, I gave you a hint to that uh, when we were on the last slide. So who are the users and stakeholders? Well, I'm going to go out on limb here and say that some of the language in interaction design research, which is really uh, human-computer interaction research, um, is, I think, different from the language that's being used in project management and is being used in systems analysis. In project management and systems analysis, the, the total group of interested parties are called the stakeholders. Okay, and the stakeholders are people who just have some, some skin in the game. They have some interest in the project. Either they're going to benefit from it, um, or they're going to be damaged by it. They're going to, uh, they're going to fund it. They're going to use the product or service that comes out of it. So there's a lot of ways that you could be a stakeholder. And only one subset of those stakeholders are actually the people who use the product or service itself. Let's say that this is a, uh, uh, a computer-based information system. Well, only some of the people are actually going to be direct users of that information system. Now, the language of human-computer interaction is very user-centric, okay? 
And so um, my explanation for, for instance, the second group of uh, bullets on the slide here, uh, three categories of user, and this comes from the researcher Eason in 1987, the primary, secondary, and tertiary. So primary users have frequent hands-on use of the uh, system or product. Secondary have occasional or via someone else. Okay, so this, uh, I guess, could be uh, somebody... Um, it would include both an occasional user who's not using on a, an everyday basis or, or uh, somebody who's kind of served by a primary user. Uh, for instance, a, uh, perhaps it's a traveler who's going to talk on the telephone with a travel agent who's a primary user. And tertiary, they, these are people who are affected by its introduction or, or, or who will influence the purchase. Okay, and I just want to point out that in the rest of the world, in um, project management and in systems analysis, it's only the primary group of users who are called users. And the secondary and tertiary users in this language of Eason are people who we would just uh, call other stakeholder groups. Uh, okay, so uh, so I guess uh, maybe some some of the secondary too. If you occasionally use the system, you're a user to everybody. Okay, but if you use it via someone else, well, if you're not actually interacting with the system, you're not a user, in the more restricted uh, sense. So this. More user-centric uh, uh, way of speaking uh, that is part of our uh, research-based history means that sometimes we might be calling people users over here in interaction at design who maybe other people who we interact with might just call stakeholders. Right. So if uh, if we go up to the top of bullet, let's go through there. Those who interact directly with the product, everybody calls them users. Those who manage it, direct users, uh, only interaction. It is the only human computer action people call human computer interaction. People would call them users. Other people would just call them stakeholders. Those who receive output from the product, stakeholders. Those who make the purchasing decision, stakeholders. Those who, who use the competitor's products, uh, stakeholders in some sense, maybe potential users. Uh, okay. Um, we, you know, maybe these are potential uh, customers or whatever. So that the language here, uh, because we're so use centric, um, that we and our uh, kind of human computer interaction ancestors uh, uh, have a little wider use of the term user than perhaps uh, some of our, our counterparts do in related professions. So uh, here on slide number 11, we're seeing uh, sort of the full ecosystem of uh, stakeholders in the project. Okay, so it could include managers and owners, uh, suppliers and local shop owners, checkout operators. I think, uh, I think we were talking about some kind of online checkout. Um, uh, capability. So I think this was a customer, if I'm trying to remember this, this was uh, uh, the, the project was for uh, the, the, the customer um, uh, checking out at a grocery store. 
Okay, so a lot of people would be interested in this uh, project in the most narrow sense. The, the people who would use the system, I think they talked about the customers who would do the checking out, and then there was an employee who would be helping them. Uh, okay, and um, and the way that I like to talk about things, uh, you know, these things, the managers and, and the owners are more stakeholders than users. And the same with uh, uh, suppliers, owners of competing shops, all those kinds of people. And the other thing is, what about the, the, the employees who uh, are not part of the self-checkout? Uh, uh, what are they? Are they users of the self-checkout system? No, they're not, but they are stakeholders in that it's going to affect the demand for their services. So we have to keep that in mind too. Okay, so that's what we mean by stakeholders. And what do we mean by needs? Now this is pretty interesting stuff for me because um, here's where we really start to see that uh, doing it, doing the design, you know, kind of understanding the needs and creating the design for a, a, a fairly standard product or service is fairly easy, okay? People have these uh, kind of expectations. You know, they know what products like this do. They know what services like this do. They know what they like. They know what they don't like. You can actually go and talk to users or potential users directly and say, well, what do you like and what you do, you do you not like? It's when you have a revolutionary product or service that it's a lot harder to just uh, simply go ask users what they like and what they don't like and what their what their preferences are um, but what you can do in those kinds of situations where it's harder for users to tell you what they need because um, you know they've never had something like you're talking about creating is that you can look at uh, the activities that they're doing, you can look at the existing tasks in the activity that your product or service is going to address and you can look at things like what's their context, what information do they require, who collaborates to achieve the task, why is it just achieved this uh, way. So you can look at at the basic activity and like and you can also have them help you understand what that activity is like in their current experience. Okay, and then perhaps you can go away and come back and offer some other product or service that addresses that set of circumstances. Okay, uh, so even if we're trying to, uh, to create a, something completely new, it is important for us to understand the environment um, in which uh, this uh, product or service is going to either solve a problem or capitalize on an opportunity. Um, so the envision tests we're going it, it, we'd like to think about can be rooted in existing behavior uh, and can be described as future scenarios, right? So uh, even when we're trying to create something completely new, users have something to tell us. We just need, we just, uh, need to ask the right questions and be observant in the right way. Now, how do we go and generate alternatives? Um, humans have a, have a tendency to stick to what they know works. But considering alternatives is important to break out of the box. So um, here's a claim on uh, bullet three here that is so mm, kind of ethnocentric. Uh, designers are trained to consider alternatives. So I guess we're saying you know, interaction designers. Software people generally are not. Well, as a guy who got his start as a software person, I, I take that personally, okay? 
And as a guy who trains uh, software people, I take that personally as well. So, um, um, uh, um, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's actually true. Okay. In any case, regardless of how we train software people, we're trying to train you as an interaction designer to consider alternatives because we feel that more than one alternative is what we need to get to an optimal solution. So how do we generate alternatives? Uh, flair and creativity, research and synthesis. Well, those are all great words. Um, one of the things that we can do is that we can look at similar products or we can look at very different uh, products. So what we're really doing is we're trying to think, oh, we're trying to think creatively, right? Now, if there are some times when nobody wants any creativity at all, okay? And you almost have to, you almost have to, uh, you almost have to grab them by the throat and get to get their attention to to even through think at all creativity creatively you know uh oh well, no we just want we just want another system we just want another device that works like that device and those devices are working fine we just want this one to be red okay and um we want the buttons to be gray okay well that's fine but uh, what if we have some more creative ideas than that? Okay. To a certain extent, people's willingness to entertain creative solutions kind of relates to the pain that they're in. If they're in a lot of pain, well, then they're open to a lot of creativity. If they're not in any pain at all, uh, then creativity seems like pain in its own right. Okay. Um, we think as interaction uh, designers, um, we're in the creativity biz. So I think it's probably our role in life to, uh, to, to entice our uh, clients uh, to make more creative approaches than they might be inclined to do on their own. Okay? Now, how could we do that? Well... One of the coolest things in the whole chapter is the example of this uh, tech box that is uh, kind of one of the parts of the culture at um, uh, the uh, design firm. And it's really funny, but I, I always call these guys IDEO, but uh, they may call themselves IDEO. Uh, I'm going to say IDEO because it's at www.idbook.com. So I've always said IDEO. Um, so what is the tech box that they have? And these guys, uh, you know, we talked about them, I think, in uh, at least in chapter one. And they, you know, they really, they really have a big uh, footprint in the design industry. Uh, and um Part of their culture is that at each of their locations, they have a tech box. And it serves, it serves as a library, a database, and a website all in one. And it contains physical gizmos for inspiration. Now, we don't quite see... Uh, yeah, so... Uh, over on the right hand side, we can see that we have these kind of flat drawers. It, it, typically, they look like they've been built out of uh, tool cabinets for auto mechanics. I mean, it looks like a very high tech end uh, tool cabinets for auto mechanics. And they just have all these uh, little goodies in them. Um, and they're all kind of um, gizmos on the edge. So these are new gizmos. And there's a good discussion in the text about how when things become commonplace, they take them out of the the uh, uh, the tech box and they replace them with some more new gizmos, so that the uh, uh, the tech box is this uh, creative. In, it, it's the source of creative inspiration. 
wants a particular uh, tool or once a particular uh, gadget becomes uh, commonplace, it, you don't need to be inspired to think about it. So this is a, a creativity uh, a creativity I was going to say generator, but not really it, 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 it's, a, it's an encourager of creativity. That's what it is. So, uh, oh, here's one with more of a clear front. So maybe it's not so much the, uh, the, um, the tool chest. Um, from the picture in the book, the one that I saw there, it looked a little more like the front was uh, stainless steel, but I like the, uh, I like the loose sight front. And the idea here is just, just get your creative juices uh, flowing. It's really a great idea. Okay, so um, uh, in addition to having a tech box, um, we did talk about as we moved into the slide, it, the idea of just looking at what at how other people solve this problem um, in competing products. Uh, in different uh, products that maybe have to, you know, don't solve the same need, uh, but might have some similar characteristics. And um, we can use uh, that kind of stuff as a way to generate a lot of ideas as well as we could something like a tech box. Um, it's not uncommon to see people who are designing information systems uh, sort of surfing around the web to see what uh, competing information systems or compatible information systems look like. So how do we choose among alternatives? Uh, well, we do evaluation with users or with peers. Um, uh, Ideally, we would like to create some kind of prototype so that we could use or test it. Okay, so we just don't want to um, we just don't want to choose things kind of analytically, although we might edit the possible alternatives through some kind of analytical approach. But ideally, we would like to take. Uh, uh, some alternatives and to prototype them and to user test them and get some real data uh, from real prospective users um, uh, with which to judge the usability and the the attractiveness of these alternatives. Um, we also want to look at uh, technical feasibility. But some ideas are just not technically feasible. So we have a great idea and we do a little bit of research in a kind of an analytical sense. And we go, you know what, that might be very appropriate if you could make it happen, but it's just not feasible today. And then we're looking at quality thresholds, okay? Um, usability goals lead to usability criteria set early on, and we need to check against them regularly. So. We might have criteria for safety. How safe is this? Either in terms of human safety or, uh, you know, say financial security, uh, utility, which uh, functions are superfluous. Uh, certainly we don't want to uh, I I introduce um, uh, functions into the user interface that, uh, are uh, simply uh, complications of the task at hand. Uh, how about the effectiveness of the approach? Do we have appropriate support? Does it cover the test? Is the information available to do the test that, that we're expecting the user to do? Um, we might look at e e e efficiency, um, uh, just how how quickly uh, can we perform uh, the task at hand given 
uh, this uh, user interface alternative. Learnability. How easy it is it to learn um, using this interface? And how does it match up with the kind of users who are going to be using the product? Um, I, I talk a lot about this, uh, 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 the work done by uh, Cooper and, uh, and uh, one of the things that Cooper really talks about a lot is, are your users novices, intermediates, or experts? Okay. If your users are all novices, well, then certainly the learnability is going to be a real issue. If your users are more likely to be intermediates or experts, well, then um, if their preferences of, say, uh, efficiency versus learnability could be completely different. Memorability, how infrequent users remember how to achieve their goal. And uh, uh, again, just to go back to Cooper and a point that I think he makes really, really well is this idea that uh, provided that you have a product that is being used voluntarily, um, a product like, uh, say, Photoshop, where you could use uh, Photoshop or a competing product, right? Uh, so you're voluntarily using it. Um, if people are novices for a short time because it, either they learn the product well enough to become an intermediate or they abandon it, okay? People can be intermediates for a really long time because to become an expert, you really have to use the product continually uh, throughout the work week and probably throughout the work day. So what will happen is that uh, some people who really use the product like say Photoshop all, all the time, um, they become uh, uh, the experts and they have the, they begun, uh, begin to have the preferences for expert uh, features. But even people who become experts uh, temporarily, as soon as their usage drops off, they fall back to being sort of these perpetual intermediates. So there's a real pretty big sweet spot in features that are aimed at intermediates because that's typically where the bulk of the users lie. Not all the time, but um, it's a, a pretty big sweet spot, perpetual intermediates. So, uh, we test uh, prototypes to choose among the uh, the alternatives. So, uh, user testing is a uh, is a, a great opportunity to get real data from um, either real users or people as close to real users as we can possibly find. And, and we get some real data. I mean, it is, so we have a lot of assumptions about how the choices that we made so far are going to play with the users. I mean, that's why we chose them. We think they're pretty promising. But um, the fact is that actually doing the testing uncovers things that uh, we missed. Okay? I, I think we tend to be able to anticipate the reactions of users like us in individually. Uh, okay, I, I think we're pretty good at that. Where I think we're weakest is at anticipating what the experience will be for users who are not like us um, individually. And so we need to predict what kind of population we're going to have and get some testing done. Now, how do we integrate this approach to interaction design to other um, models, in particular uh, software engineering or systems development lifecycle models, okay? Um, now, 
the the approach that seemed appealing to us uh, for our let's see if we have it here. Let's just back up to the approaches that we had back here. Where are they? Right here. Okay. So we have we have the list. Sorry. Uh, there it is. So we have the list of the activities, and they happen kind of chronologically. So we can think of them in, in the classic uh, kind of waterfall approach to uh, uh, systems uh, development. First, we'll establish the requirements, then we'll design the alternatives, then we'll do prototyping, then we'll evaluate, then we'll pick one of the prototypes and we'll build it. Okay. Well, um, this model here, which um, uh, is much more uh, iterative, is probably uh, is going to give you more optimal results. For instance, we might build uh, two prototypes and find that we'd like um, uh, we'd like um, one third of the features from one, but two thirds of the features from the other one. Well. I, I don't know what we do. Do we just uh, pick those uh, features? Do we build a third uh, prototype in which we get the best of all the worlds and then go evaluate that and see how that goes? Well, that would be, I, I think, a really nice thing to do. So this, this ability to go from establishing the requirements to designing alternatives to prototyping to e e evaluating in a kind of fluid way um, this, I think, is uh, very appealing to us as a design team. Well, it turns out that in software development, there's this uh, movement afoot called uh, Agile Software Development, if we can get to it. Um, and it is uh, very popular right now. It stresses the importance of iteration. Um, it champions early and regular feedback. It handles emergent requirements. It aims to strike a balance between flexibility and structure. And um, uh, of course, in my, my other responsibilities in teaching project management, um, uh, I do a lot of work in teaching groups how to do, uh, how to manage uh, software development uh, projects using the Agile approach. And the most uh, popular of the Agile approaches is called Scrum. And in Scrum, we do uh, some planning up front. Uh, we come up with a product vision, we come up with a product road map. Uh, then we uh, we sort of enumerate the features in terms of these things that we call user stories. Um, user stories are very uh, scenario oriented. Uh, sometimes people do things like uh, uh, create um, personas, which uh, we haven't done a lot of talking about personas yet, but we will soon, uh, that are part of the user stories. Um, and then uh, what we it typically take is we take all these user stories that are on a backlog and we begin to build them. Um, and uh, we build subsets of the functionality in these iterations, pretty short ones called sprints. So um, is that exactly the model that we showed with all the feedback between our four activities? No, it's not exactly the model, but it's pretty friendly to the model that we're talking about. And so this, um, this uh, kind of interest in um, more flexible... Um, more flexible relationships between requirements, design, prototyping, uh, e e e e evaluation, um, and not just doing them, say, one time in a uh, 
very deterministic uh, kind of way. Um, uh, it, the Agile approach to software development is very friendly to that. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, the nice thing for us as interaction designers is that uh, software development methodologies are kind of headed our way, right? So um, that's good. So let's uh, summarize a bit. So the four basic activities in this uh, interaction design process, establishing the requirements, designing alternatives, prototyping, evaluating. Um, we're not claiming that they're going to be done in a uh, sort of waterfall-oriented deterministic way, OK? Uh, so we talked a lot about that. And user-centered uh, design, which is what we um, are learning to do, that's the approach that uh, we prefer. Uh, has an early focus on users and tasks. We want to do empirical measurement using quantifiable and measurable usability criteria and iterative uh, design. So that's the big picture that's going to hold all of our activities together. And with that, I'm going to say bye until next time. Bye-bye.